drought has been at the front of people's minds lately. And as we enter the fall planting season, we want to continue to think about drought as we plan the landscape. We want to look for plants that can tolerate Oklahoma's extreme weather conditions. We go from uh, really cold winters to dry, hot summers. We want to consider plant material that's drought tolerant, maybe uh, some xeriscape plants, and also look to natives. Uh, our natives are adapted to local conditions, and many of these will outperform introduced plants during variable weather. Now, as we look at Oklahoma and move from one part of the state across to the other end, we see the native tree species are incredibly diverse, and they shift, uh, the composition of native plants shifts as we move from east to west, and this follows rainfall patterns. So when we're looking for plants that can do well in our specific region, we could turn to those native plants as a source of inspiration and a way to find plants that are really locally adapted. And that's something that we want to consider. Our, our location uh, conditions here in Stillwater are quite different from those out in Woodward, for example. So today we're going to look at a few native trees. Uh, many of these are very drought tolerant. Uh, and some of them make beautiful landscape trees as well. And the first one I want to look at is this bald cypress, Taxodium distichum. Now bald cypress is very interesting. It's native to the southeast part of the state, and we readily associate it with swamps and wetlands. But it's also very drought tolerant, and that might seem a little bit ironic because of the way we picture it. Uh, I like to use bald cypress in beds rather than a tree out in the lawn, and that's because of the knees that can develop. If we put it up in a bed, we don't have to worry about mowing around those knees. Um, I think the, the tree itself with this really soft, fine textured foliage is very graceful in the landscape. It makes a beautiful tree, and there are many different cultivars, some of the newer cultivars that have different forms. Um, for example, earlier this season, we looked at Lindsay's Skyward, which is very upright, but there are also some weeping forms. So we have a wonderful diversity to choose from. Many of our native oaks are well adapted for use in the landscape, and several of these have been selected as Oklahoma proven plants. Now these, of course, are very large specimen trees, and so they need a large space. They're ideal for larger landscapes as well as public parks. The first one I want to look at is the bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa. And I think of this as the granddaddy of all oaks. It is a majestic tree. It reaches a mature height of 80 feet. It has a wide spread. It's really very bold, strong tree for the landscape. One of my favorite features of the bur oak are the eggcorns. And these are actually kind of small for bur oak eggcorns because they fell off prematurely. Um, we're probably not going to see many acorns on our trees this year because of the drought, but these can actually get uh, almost twice larger than this. So, uh, but they have this large cap and a little frill along the edge. They're very distinctive, and when you see these, you know you have a bur oak. Now, another great oak for the landscape is the Schumard oak, and this is Quercus schumardii. Again, another Oklahoma proven selection, and this tree reaches about the same height as the bur oak. It'll reach a mature height of close to 80 feet. Now sometimes if you're in a really windswept area, um, we get a bit of topping out of the trees and they won't reach that full of uh, size. If we go a little bit norther to a more protected area or even a wetter area, they'll reach that full 80 feet. So they might be a little bit smaller in some of our Oklahoma landscapes. Um, this one has smaller acorns and the leaves are a little bit more cut and oftentimes it'll have a nice pyramidal form in its maturity. Another oak that is soon to join the ranks of Oklahoma proven is the chinkapin oak, Quercus muhlenbergii. This is a very fast growing oak and so it's quite popular as a landscape tree. It has a very nice shiny green foliage and in the fall beautiful red color and that's one of the reasons that it's so attractive for the landscape. Now all of these oaks are very drought tolerant and good selections for the landscape. This is the cedar elm tree, Ulmus crassifolia. Now it has a, a much smaller leaf than the American elm tree, and the leaves have a, a fairly rough texture to the touch. In the springtime they're going to be a glossy green, 
and in the fall it'll turn a magnificent golden yellow color. Now one of the great features about the cedar elm is that it tolerates heavy poorly drained clay soils and that's something that I know I'm always looking for in the landscape here at the studio. Another feature is that it can tolerate moderate compaction of the soil and that makes it a good choice as an urban street tree. One of my favorite landscape trees is the hackberry, Celtis occidentalis. Like the elms of old, these trees form a very large spreading canopy, sort of a vase shape that stretches out, provides wonderful shade for a little patio area or a walkway. It's a great shade tree for the landscape. My favorite feature of this tree is the corky bark, and this is an adaptation to fire that would have occurred naturally in many areas of the tree's native range. It's a very tough, adaptable tree. It can tolerate a wide range of soil conditions from alkaline to acidic and also wet or dry soils. So a really tough tree that you can use in many different situations. Well, this was just a few of the many, many native trees that are available and adaptable to the landscape. For more information and uh, more options, you can look at the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry's booklet called Native Trees for Oklahoma. The majority of our fall garden we've planted from seed. Planting from seed has many advantages over planting transplants. For the fall garden, the greatest of these is avoiding transplant shock. Many of our fall crops are actually planted in July or August when the temperatures are still high. So starting from seed can eliminate any shock to the plants by moving a plant during this incredibly hot days. Another advantage we find is variety. There's so many more choices when we look through a seed catalog as opposed to going to the garden center. And one of these is for heirloom cultivars and a good example would be uh, we planted these Native American bush beans and we could never find these in a garden center. You'd have to find them from a seed saver exchange program or a hand-me-down from a friend like we had. Now if you grow organically it can be difficult to find organic transplants and so starting from seed, uh, organically grown seed is one way to get past that problem. If you are looking for organic transplants, one source might be your local farmer's market. Sometimes growers there will have organically raised transplants for sale. And the final advantage that I think of is timing. We can control the timing of our crop much better when we're raising those seedlings ourselves, as opposed to relying on a garden center, having those plants ready at the proper time for our personal situation. Well, today I'm going to sow some spinach and radish seeds here in our window box. When we plant from seed, we want to start with a nice loose soil bed. So I start by loosening it up. I'm actually, since I'm planting in a window box, we have potting soil in here, but it's been in here for uh, a full season or two, so it's good to loosen up that surface a little bit. And then we want to smooth it out. So we have a nice level bed. If there's any weeds in there, you want to pull them out so they're not competing with your plants. Now when we're planting seeds, we want to pay careful attention to planting depth. And the general rule of thumb is that we plant a seed two to three times the width or diameter of that seed. So for radishes and spinach, spinach both of those plant, plants are put at a depth of about one half inch. And so I'm going to start by digging two furrows. I'm going to put my radishes in the front because they're a little bit shorter and my spinach seeds in the back. And then I'm going to just simply spread the seeds out through in there. Now it's sometimes hard to drop a single seed, especially when they're very small. We could come back later and thin these out. We want our radish seeds eventually to be uh, separated by about a one inch and our spinach seeds will be spread about six inches apart. Remember, it's very important to keep your, plant, uh, your seedlings well watered so that they can germinate properly. Mm -hmm. 